Pushpa. And um, first of all, let me thank both Pushpa and Nishir for being such wonderful partners. Um, we at CAPS work across Asia um, with a number of partners, but I just have to say that these two are among my favorite. Um, and um, in fact, we love India so much that we have incorporated a sister organization there, recently incorporated, called the Center for Asian Philanthropy in India. And our two board members, Jamshik Gadrij and Ramadorai, are on this call, um, for which I'm very grateful. Um, so um, we look forward to doing even more work in India. Um, in India is, I, I, it's not news flash to anyone on this call that India is a very complicated place. Um, and there are amazing, wonderful, positive, constructive things going on there. And there are also challenges. Um, and um, it is absolutely a mixture of all, everything you can find in the world in the social sector you can find in India. Um, so it's an extraordinary opportunity and challenge for us to work there. Before I go into what the Doing Good Index is and what its implications are for India, um, let me just tell you what CAPS is. The Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society is a research and advisory um, nonprofit organization. We are based in Hong Kong, but we work across the region. And as I mentioned, we now have a sister organization, which doesn't yet have its own website, but um, just recently incorporated in India. Um, our mission is to increase the quality and quantity of private resources toward doing good. So that's philanthropy, CSR, impact investing, the whole lot of how private resources are brought to bear on social, on solving social challenges. Um, we try to do our work very much grounded from Asia. We try to look at what works in Asia, what are the models and strategies that work on the ground in this part of the world, and what does the rest of the world need to learn from Asia, from India, from Southeast Asia, from the other, from East Asia, from the other countries, um, around the region. And we think that Asia leads in many ways and our work tries to reflect that. Um, so let me talk to you about the Doing Good Index. We know that the word unprecedented is, has been used an unprecedented number of times in the past, during 2020. Um, these are extraordinary times and, um, and with unparalleled challenges across all fronts. We also know that the social sector has risen to the occasion um, by providing food aid, healthcare, medical services, um, working with government and providing, you know, using the resources that they have. Um, at the same time, the social sector has been doing all the work that it was doing pre-COVID-19. So, um, and when I say social sector, I'm talking about the nonprofits and social enterprises, many of you are on the call, philanthropy and CSR, working together to address societal issues. And let me just say that if anyone on this, uh, in this webinar filled out our survey for the Doing Good Index, thank you, thank you. And we're gonna send you another one next year. Please fill it out. Um, we, we rely on you for the data that we use. Um, so why, why the DGI? Um, what we realized was that throughout Asia, there is an incredible trust deficit. And we're gonna talk about that in greater detail later in the presentation. But the trust deficit is a fairly significant obstacle that has decreased the potential of private resources going toward doing good. And there's other obstacles too. In fact, if you look at the United States as, as, as an example, um, it's generally considered that the philanthropy in the United States is equivalent to 2% of the GDP of that country. What is 2% of the 18 economies we look at? That's 587 billion US dollars a year if we could reach that 
That 587 is 12 times the amount of foreign aid that flows into Asia and one third of the annual cost in achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, we, we could do a lot if we unleashed that amount of funds and there's no reason to think that we can't. So we work together with our partners to try to figure out how we can do it, what kinds of system changes we need um, to unleash that money or even surpass that American bar. Um, so we, the Doing Good Index gives us three sets of tools that help us to think about increasing private resources toward doing good, aligning incentives around doing good, mitigating the trust deficit, which I just referred to, and maximizing private social investment that flows into the sector. India is not starting from scratch. I think you all know that you're part of one of the most vibrant civil society sectors, social sectors in the world if not the most vibrant in, in, uh, along many um, counts. So there are many initiatives going forward there. We're just trying to understand what we know works and, and try to help people to be as effective and as impactful as possible. The Doing Good Index is a robust study. We did it in 18 economies, that's 16 countries plus Hong Kong and Taiwan, 2,189 social delivery organizations filled out a rather lengthy survey, which we're grateful for again, um, and 145 experts were surveyed or interviewed along with our partners. In this year's Doing Good Index, which I have in front of me, right here, it's quite a weighty tome. Um, we include 18 economy profiles that really give you the state of play in the sector. Um, the economy profiles were written primarily by our partners and in the case of India, primarily by Nishir Dajawala. Thank you, Nishir. Um, and um, we think it's a very useful snapshot of where India is, but you can also look at other countries. I want to encourage everyone on this, um, in this webinar to go to our site at caps.org, C-A-P-S.org. The report is free and we have a really unbelievably ex uh, excellent, my opinion, my, my completely unbiased, uh, unbiased opinion, um, <laughs> microsite, which allows you to play with the data yourself and compare countries and pull up whatever you're interested in. So please take a look. The index is divided into four cat, uh, kind of sets of indicators. Three of them have to do with government policies and regulations. So the first one is regulations and regulations account for how efficient the sector is managed how money flows, um, how accountable and transparent the sector is, and how well laws and regulations are communicated. The second set is tax and fiscal policies, and those are really incentives for donors, mostly in terms of tax incentives and subsidies, and also for recipients, whether or not it's easy or possible to be a tax exempt organization. Um, or a you know 25 a section 25 company or section 8 the different types of tax exempt organizations in India um, trusts of course uh, count in that um, the third government set of indicators is procurement we actually think that th that one is not weighted quite as much as the other three but we think government can procure the services from the social sector. And that's really helpful and important. It legitimizes the sector. And Mevesh will give more examples of that in her part of the presentation. And then the fourth part is ecosystem, which is really about society's embrace of philanthropy and CSR and doing good. And those questions really look at what is the perception of nonprofits, of social enterprises? What are, are there awards? Are there things like, like what um, Pushpa is involved in, such as um, Giving Tuesday. Are there different mechanisms to 
increase and support and, and applaud efforts to engage. How easy is it to get talent? And are, are there good, is there good governance mostly? So we're gonna go through what our findings are, but these are the large sections of the index. Um, why isn't it moving? Can you, can you go to, okay. Oh, so this is the index and we, um, we, I, it's important to point out that these are in alphabetical order within cluster. Our goal here is not to name and shame, but really to say, are there commonalities in each of the clusters and allow, um, which would help people and governments and corporations in effect move forward. And you can see that this is the second time we've done the doing good index and a number of countries have actually moved up or down in the index. The two were, who, which were originally in the not doing enough category in 2018, Indonesia and Myanmar have actually moved up. Um, and I was very pleased when, when, when the index was first uh, released, the government of civil affairs, the governor, the, the, the minister of civil affairs in Myanmar tweeted that Myanmar had moved up in the doing good index and he was very proud of that. And we think it's a terrific sign. Cambodia and Nepal are newcomers to this to, to participating in the Doing Good Index, and they have a lot of opportunity and some low-hanging fruit, which would allow them to um, progress. Please note that this study is actually on a scale of five. No economy passes a four, which means that even Singapore and Taiwan have opportunity to do even better. Um, so, um, and we can answer what each cluster more detail if you're interested in the Q&A um, period. So having said that, I'm going to um, hand over the microphone to my colleague, Mevesh Mumtaz Ahmed, who is our director of research, who's gonna take us through the specifics when it comes to India. Thank you very much, Ruth. And namaste to everyone and salam. I think that was the title of a Bollywood movie, Salam Namaste, which I haven't seen, but- Salam Bombay. No, that was a different one. See, <laughs> she knows much more about Bollywood than I do. <laughs> Especially if it has any of the Khans in it. <laughs> uh, so Salam Namaste, everyone. Don't I, they all have Khans in them? I no, think. no, there's, there's, other, there's other Bollywood actors and actresses. <laughs> Um, uh, before I go on to the next part, can I just uh, request anyone who has a question to please type it out in the chat box. At the end, we will have time for a Q&A and we would actually love to hear from you, your comments and questions. Um, and uh, th that will contribute to a great discussion at the end. So please do not hesitate to uh, write your, type your questions out in the chat box. Um, so let's now talk about specifically about where India is today and where the Doing Good Index shows us uh, it can be. It's in the doing okay cluster, but it can do better. And at a very sort of zoomed out level, um, we know that both uh, positive and some not so positive uh, winds have been blowing, headwinds have been blowing in India. Uh, India is one of the um, only, one of the few countries in the world that have mandated corporate giving. And that is a signal that the government is acknowledging the potential of domestic philanthropy, domestic resources. We know that corporate giving has gone up as a result, uh, although individual philanthropy uh, has yet to keep pace with that. But at the same time, there has been increased oversight of the social sector and the mistrust between government and the social sector is still in play. And by the way, India is not alone in this. We see this mistrust across uh, economies in Asia. And as Ruth mentioned, it was actually one of the main motivating factors for us to come up with the Doing Good Index to try and uh, identify and break down the reasons for this mistrust. So India is by far uh, to, from the only economy. And to address them. And to address them, absolutely. Yeah. So how can India do better? And we have, our insights are divided into three groups. We think there is definitely room for number one, improved regulations. Number two, better incentives for giving. And this is where we will talk about taxes as well as the CSR law. And finally, number three, there is greater room for more collaboration between the government, the social and the private sectors. And we'll walk you through all of these. But let's first start with 
the regulations. Now, regulations, and Ruth normally says this when she speaks about them, they're like cholesterol. There's good cholesterol that keeps everything flowing and working, and then there's bad cholesterol. And the idea, the point of balanced regulations is to have enough of the good and le less of the bad cholesterol in them. And what we see in India is that regulations, the regulatory framework and landscape which the social sector operates in is a mixed bag. We know that uh, uh, recently more registration processes have gone online. That has made it easier for organizations to register. So these kinds of regulations have injected more efficiency into the system. That's great. It's also removed um, the opportunity for um, corruption and fraud uh, because there's a paper, an electronic paper trail for um, registering and setting up. But at the same time, Indian laws pertaining to the social sector remain complex. And you can see that with the circle on the right, where half of the social delivery organizations, mostly nonprofits in India that we surveyed for the Doing Good Index, tell us that these laws are difficult to understand. When laws are difficult to understand, they are difficult to comply with. And any non-compliance, because they're difficult to understand, further feeds into the mistrust that government and the social sector may feel uh, towards each other. And here I just want to give a, a very short antidote, anecdote, not an antidote, anecdote, that I had a government official tell me, <coughs> all of our laws are available on the website. We're very clear with them. And my retort was, I have a PhD from Stanford, and I cannot understand what the laws that you put on your website. So it's not enough to just put them up there. They have to be actually understandable. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that can be done in that regard. And, and, and I like Noshir's little cheering squad on the side. <laughs> Noshir, keep doing that. Uh, uh, so not only do the laws remain complex, but despite some of the technology that has been brought to use here, you can see that in India, it still takes twice the amount of time that it does on average in Asia for a nonprofit to set up and start operating. So there's um, there's room for improvement over here. And speaking of time, we also know that procedural delays when it comes to getting tax exemption or FRC, F FCRA certification are also quite rampant. So there is room for improving regulations, making processes more efficient. And like I said before, India is not alone in this, but these are some of the, um, the India specific uh, regulatory roadblocks that we see. Now, another very critical part of regulation speaks to the trust deficit. Good cholesterol regulations can really help build transparency and accountability. For example, requiring um, annual reporting as stock, list, uh, stock exchange listed companies are required to do, or requiring nonprofits to submit audited annual accounts, or building in other accountability measures. And we see here again, that uh, India has some of these measures very much in place. Uh, we see that almost all STO, almost all organizations in India have a board. Boards provide independent oversight. That's great. We also know that in India, uh, senior staff and board members can be held legally liable for their organization's non-compliance. So two important channels for transparency and accountability are set in place. I just also want to add in here that um, the social stock exchange um, is, is another effort by government to increase accountability, transparency, as well as unleash um, additional funds. And of course, we all know that that has not been put into place quite yet. And these are early days. But um, it's exciting that the government is trying to address these issues and, and through something innovative like the social stock exchange. Right, and we will speak a bit more to that as well um, towards the end. Uh, so it's not only the, the government that is putting in place transparency and accountability mechanisms. We see healthy movement within the Indian social sector itself to do that, do that as well through the rise of nonprofit uh, coalitions and self-certification agencies such as GuideStar, Credibility Alliance, and then you can actually maybe share with us in the chat box even more examples that you may uh, know of. And GuideStar, as Ruth mentioned, has, is, is a valued partner for us in India and knows the pain of getting these nonprofits to fill out our very long, very detailed uh, survey for this, uh, for this study. Um, 
But there are, again, a few gaps in this good cholesterol here. Filing of annual reports, as far as we know, is optional for uh, Indian nonprofits. And we also know that oversight of nonprofits in India can come from many different agencies, and that can create confusion to an already complicated lattice of regulations that governs this sector. Um, so we know, for example, that uh, trusts and societies are governed by state, state charity commissions. Commissioners, we know that nonprofit companies are under the jurisdiction of the registrar for companies. Tax issues are taken care of by the income tax department. Uh, foreign funding is taken care of by the Ministry of Home Affairs. So there's multiple oversight agencies that nonprofits have to navigate. And some simplicity in that can go a long way towards making um, uh, operations and uh, in in uh, in the social sector more efficient and quick. Now let's also now look at the second part where we were going to talk about the better improved incentives for giving. And before we do that, let's take a quick look at what the funding landscape of nonprofits in India looks like. And what we want to highlight particularly is the role that foreign funding plays. And we'll speak to government funding as well as corporate funding in just a couple of minutes as well. But you can see that half of the nonprofits that we surveyed receive foreign funding, and it makes up a pretty, pretty significant chunk of the budget, around 13%. We also know, and again, this is not just true in India, but we know that foreign funding was declining across the region in Asia even before COVID, as Asian economies were getting richer and donors, international donors were looking towards poorer economies to help them out. Um, we observed that 10 out of the 18 economies that we looked at reported declining foreign funding, and this is before COVID. COVID, if anything, is accelerating this trend. Every one of us is in this together, and there is a push for government and domestic resources to really go towards meeting domestic needs because everyone is in this together. No one is outside and can say, we're unaffected and we can help you. So foreign funding, which half of Indian nonprofits seem to rely on, was declining before COVID, that is accelerated during COVID. And India is uh, one of the six economies in Asia that has put in place additional scrutiny of foreign funding that is further dampening the flow of foreign funding um, into the region. And how are, how are nonprofits responding? What our data tells us is that 81% of nonprofits that report a decline in foreign funding are cognizant that they need to turn to domestic donors. Um, and in India, particularly, half of the nonprofits that receive foreign funding are reporting that fundraising is becoming more difficult. Um, so there is this need and a push, a demand for greater domestic resource, resources to replace that foreign funding. And it's unleashing this domestic philanthropy, domestic CSR, and domestic impact investment that is exactly what the Doing It Good Index uh, talks about and shows how to unleash. So let's look at uh, what's part of the solution over here. Well, one incredible um, step that India has taken that it should be lauded for is uh, the introduction of the CSR law, where qualifying companies devote 2% uh, of their pre-tax profits uh, towards uh, the social sector and meeting social needs. It's, it's only one of two economies in, um, in Asia that has done that, and it has unleashed a lot of resources towards the corporate sector. And again, I mean, talking about the impact of this law, including some of the, um, uh, you know, many of the upsides, but some of the downsides can be its own webinar. But maybe if you have questions about this, we can address them um, at the end. We can address CSR questions, but I also want to point to KPMG, which does an annual study of the CSR laws. And um, it, those are excellent and um, available on their website. And I think they're also listening uh, to this webinar. Yes, I think right we, now. Might have, <laughs> we might so have. We might want to share. They might want to share a link to uh, the reports that Ruth is um, talking about. That's right. Um, all right. So CSR law, great. But there are there is another very critical tool that is available to governments that can really help pull more private social investment into the social sector. And that's taxes. And I know taxes are not the most interesting or exciting thing to talk about, but we must in the context of domestic philanthropy because 
taxes are extremely important in Asia for two reasons. The first is that when um, a tax deduction, a tax incentive is offered for donations, it has an actual effect on increasing donations into the social sector. That is well documented. But in Asia, there is a second more powerful impact of tax incentives for giving. And that is in Asia, institutions, including companies, individuals, everyone, prefers to work in tandem with government and really listen to government signaling. So when the government says we are putting in place 100% tax subsidy for any donations you give to the private to the social sector, people will take note and they will take this as a strong signal of support for the social sector. And it, it's this soft but very strong, powerful signaling effect of taxes um, that makes us really highlight and spotlight the role of taxes in um, encouraging domestic philanthropy. And we see in India that there is a mixed signal here. Um, India offers a 50% rate of tax deduction uh, for both individual and corporate donations. And it's one of only four economies in Asia that offers a rate that is lower than 100%. So there's a clear path here um, for some of these mixed signals to be replaced by strong supportive signals for giving. And one of them is by increasing the tax uh, uh, subsidy to 100%. And it's not just us who are saying that these tax incentives are important. Let's look at what Indian nonprofits who we surveyed are telling us. They're telling us most of them, first of all, believe that the level of individual giving in India is low. 80% of them believe that it's low. And one of the top reasons that they cite for these low levels of giving is actually a lack of strong enough tax incentives for donations. So we have, um, it's, it's it, the voice of the social sector is also behind this, um, in, the importance that tax incentives can play. And an interesting aside here um, that I want to mention is that, um, remember when I talked about how Indian and other nonprofits are turning towards domestic donors, 81% of them are turning towards domestic donors. One potential game changer has been the rise uh, of retail fundraising and the rise of crowdfunding in India. 40% um, of the nonprofits we surveyed said that they are crowdfunding now. And uh, almost 80% said that they intend to in the future. And these are amongst the highest proportions in Asia. And of course, the little caveat here is that crowdfunding and online fundraising is still unregulated. So maybe something for the sector uh, and policymakers to think about so that this doesn't become another avenue where uh, mistrust can be bred instead of uh, a fantastic new way for Indians to participate in philanthropy. Now, the final piece um, that uh, the index tells us about how India can improve its performance is collaboration. But you know, we don't want to just talk about collaboration in, in general terms. We want to be specific about it. Um, so let's first look at collaboration between the government and the social sector. The government can support the social sector in a number of ways. Uh, one is through direct funding. And we see that almost 40% of Indian nonprofits get grants, although these tend to be small ticket grants, they make up only about 6% of the average budget. But the piece that we want to focus on is procurement. And as Ruth mentioned earlier, why, why do we care about procurement? Government procuring service delivery from the social sector. And again, in Asia, there are two reasons. One is that when the government procures social services from uh, nonprofits, it is helping build the capacity of these nonprofits and helping them scale and grow larger. But the other reason is when the government is procuring services, it is signaling that this sector is legitimate. It is adding legitimacy and signaling its trust in the sector. So government engagement through procurement is, um, is, is an important tool in Asia uh, and in India, both to increase both to help the social sector grow, but also to mitigate some of the trust deficit. And there's an example in India, when you think about um, think tanks in India, specific, especially policy and economic think tanks, they get a lot of government mm -hmm. procurement contracts. And India has the most flourishing think tank ecosystem in all of Asia. So we're advocating that kind of um, procurement and that, that kind of connection between social delivery organizations and the government as well. 
and I'll add to that, Ruth, also that we this this trend has not taken off yet in Asia, but the potential for subnational procurement, procurement by states or districts, um, is uh, that that potential is actually huge uh, in India. So uh, that's one avenue that can be looked at. And while that is happening, there is also uh, you know some mixed news here that those nonprofits that were engaged in procurement contracts with government did find it difficult to access information about them and they found the whole approval process very difficult as well so again you know maybe technology can be brought to bear here we do see um, online procurement platforms in a few other asian economies that if india were to adopt could make the process more transparent and more efficient now, the other kind of collaboration that we want to talk about is between companies and the social sector. And the corporate sector can actually engage with uh, the social sector in many ways. The first of which is funding. And we see that half of uh, Indian nonprofits receive corporate funding, and it makes up about 16% of their budget. And both of these numbers are about the same as the Asian average. Um, whether uh, CSR, the CSR funding is going to move this further, increase this proportion is something that we will be keeping an eye on. But between the Doing Good Index 2018 and 2020, we haven't seen this proportion move um, that much. But um, there are other ways in which companies can um, engage with the social sector and participate in mitigating the trust deficit. One is uh, by volunteering. And we see here that 71% of Indian nonprofits actually work with corporate volunteers, which is, which is great. Um, the reason we think that corporate engagement through volunteering and through sitting on nonprofit boards, which I will just talk about in, in a half a minute, is that it can lead to, um, first of all, both sectors really getting to know each other that helps mitigate the trust deficit, but also skills transfer. The social sector is perpetually under-resourced. If the corporate sector can lend skills in accounting, legal services, financial forecasting, it can help build the capacity of uh, the social sector and provide much needed support to it. And it's on the board's side that we see that there's a bit of a gap. There is room for growth. Um, half of Indian nonprofits do not have any corporate representation on their boards and three quarters of them find it very hard to recruit corporate uh, membership uh, for their boards as well. Uh, and I, Ruth, you like to say that if, if in the CSR law, volunteering was recognized as a contribution, do you want to speak to that? Well, as, as all of you know, in the CSR law, um, time was not included. So it's just monetary resources. And that is something to be discussed and debated um, whether um, in-kind, uh, in-kind allocations, in-kind resources, but also volunteer time could be counted and encouraged through the CSR regulation. Right. Um, and before I hand back to Ruth, I just want to leave you with a couple of challenges and opportunities that still persist. And the first of them will not be a surprise to anyone who has worked in the social sector or with the social sector, massive talent gap. Um, three quarters of Indian STOs struggle to retain and recruit talent. And this is not that surprising when um, a perception exists and is widespread, in fact, that nonprofit staff should earn less than their for-profit counterparts. And, and we can have a, a longer discussion about this as well. I like to call it the social tax. Those of us who choose to work in the social sector pay, us, pay a social tax on our incomes. Um, we also see that donor support for capacity building that can go towards hiring talent and training them and keeping them engaged is, um, is quite weak. So only about less than 20%, less than a fifth of nonprofits in India and across Asia receive consistent support, donor support for capacity building. Uh, and often there, there may also be a cap on admin expenses, which is typically where um, human resources and uh, 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 talent incomes, uh, fees and all will, uh, will fall into as well. It's a myth throughout Asia that administrative costs must be kept low without really understanding where those funds are going and what the needs are for, for talent, where the administration, including capacity building, mm -hmm. And, um, and so we really need to educate the government and the donors 
as to why, what those administrative costs are. And I'm in my in, in our call to action at the end, I'm going to give some specifics as to how. Um, there's an opportunity, there's a couple of opportunities actually that we've identified in India. One of them is the rise of social enterprises, which are organizations that are using business operations to meet social need and they can be for profit, not just non-profit. Um, India, uh, by some estimates, we, we actually did a study on this as well, on social enterprises and impact investment in, in Asia, uh, where we covered six economies in detail, uh, plus a spotlight on India and China. And this is also on our website. Um, and by some estimates, we know that uh, th there may be around 2 million social enterprises in India already. That's a massive number. We also know that the impact investment market in India has uh, been growing apace. It, it doubled over a five-year period. And there's the potential for much more. But there's also a concern, as you can see, 52% of nonprofits did express a concern as well that if the pie of resources that is available for meeting social needs does not grow, then there may be competition between social enterprises and nonprofits. So that's something that we, we should be aware of. Uh, and when we talk to nonprofits and social enterprises, they really do want to work with each other. They see each other as complements and not substitutes. So hopefully it's, it's our role as donors and, and policymakers to ensure that that's how the relationship continues to evolve and does not become competitive. Um, I'm going to skip over some of the findings. Uh, okay. We can talk about that if you want later. Uh, a final opportunity, as Ruth mentioned earlier, is the social stock exchange, which leverages the rise of social enterprises, uh, creates an opportunity to channel individual giving and experiment with new forms of investing that are taking root um, in India and can also help improve um, more kind of interaction between the different stakeholders um, that work with the social sector. In, in India, uh, only about 60% of nonprofits say they are involved in policy consultation sometimes or more. And that's uh, that lags behind Asia where that percentage is about three quarters. So the social stock exchange can maybe help. And with that, uh, with that I will pass the mic back to Ruth. Um, I just want to end with, uh, with some specifics call to action. Um, as I said earlier, I India is an extremely dynamic uh, country with a lot happening in the social sector. And sometimes I say that India is the Petri dish of, of everything that, that all the innovation that's happening. Some of it is good and some of it is not so good. Um, and so we really, but experimentation and innovation in and of itself is good. And we need to really learn what works and discard what doesn't. So what can governments do? Um, clearly, we need to have clearer, better regulations that really help the system to thrive and flourish. And in India, it's a mixed bag. Um, so we really need to work with policymakers to have them understand which policies aid transparency and accountability and help the sector to flourish and which ones are really holding it back. Taxes are another one that Mevish mentions because of the signaling, government signals. When government says um, that we want to um, focus on, um, I'm sorry, the Indian word for this, sanitation. Swatch Bharat, Swatch Bharat. Um, a lot of effort went into mm -hmm. sanitation. When government says we now have a PM CARES program, a lot of money goes into PM CARES. Government signaling is powerful in India and, um, and we wanna help government to signal the right thing. Um, what can companies do? Well, companies can absolutely fund through their CSR, whether they're part of the 18,000 that, 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 that are mandated through the CSR regulation or the other millions that are not, um, they can provide funding. They can also, as Mevar said, provide skill transfer and they can engage in partnerships, both public private partnerships with government and also partnerships with nonprofit organizations. Today's problems are very complex and we need all hands on deck and we need to find ways that we can work together in a more efficient collegial manner. And then what can social sector organizations do? We at CAPS often get asked by nonprofits 
to help them to raise money. Um, and we all, all nonprofits suffer from resource shortages. And my answer is you have to also be accountable yourself. Um, you have to tell your story. You have to put, cr create a beautiful website that helps people understand the impact. If your administrative costs are high, you have to explain why. So it is incumbent on um, social delivery organizations to take the lead in helping people to understand why they are important, what their impact is, and where the money goes. Uh, that helps government, companies, and individuals engage with them, and it builds trust. So we, everybody has a role to play, and um, we think only by working together and everyone stepping up and doing a better job can we address the challenges that we have before us. So with that, I really want to thank you and turn the um, microphone back over to Pushpa. Thank you, Ruth and Mevesh. Uh, you've really, uh, you know, uh, your findings and your recommendations are so much in line with possibly what I'm going to be speaking towards the end. Um, but with that uh, backdrop before us, I think uh, uh, it's time to turn to Noshir, uh, who we've been hearing in the sector, you know, over the last couple of months. Uh, Noshir can really provoke our thoughts and our minds, and I, I hope he also has some answers I, for I, I uh, think it's the last couple of are... decades, Pushpa, not a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think he, he just completed 33 years of yeah. um, apps. Uh, yeah. But I just wanted to, when I was talking about the months, it was more about the webinar, mm -hmm. uh, webinars everyone has been going to, and Noshir has been there on almost every one of them, yeah. uh, helping yeah. us understand and, you know, unpack all of those changes and those clouds that have been uh, becoming more visible, the darker clouds on our, on our Indian skies. Thank so you. over to you, Noshir. You. Uh, talk to us about the challenges that are emerging in front of us. Yeah, Thank that. You. Uh, that's not exactly my favorite topic, but <laughs> but it's the only topic that I speak about, uh, hopefully with some solutions uh, off and on. Uh, so today's theme, or rather this entire project, which uh, Ruth and Mevesh and her team is working on is about the doing good index. To do good, essentially, you need three resources. You need human resource, you need financial resource, and you need good legal resource. What do humans do? Humans provide what is called the three T's. They can give up their time, they can give up their talent, and they can give up their treasure or what you might call the wealth. Because, uh, but wealth is not the only thing you can give. There is also the time and talent. And of course, finance is required. But unless the economy is doing well, philanthropy will also take a dip. And this has been historically seen by people. The economy is not doing well, literally globally, but uh, it's one of the factors we need to keep in mind. But the third important after human and financial is the legal regime. Is the legal regime enabling philanthropy or doing good or is it disabling? And I'm actually using the word, is it disabling? I think one of the first challenges we have and which uh, Ruth and Mavesh uh, touched upon is this trust deficit, this mistrust that government has about the voluntary sector. And I think this mistrust arises from the fact that they think most nonprofit organizations are either anti-national or anti-development, which is not the case. Most of them, if you look at a pyramid, the base of the pyramid is these are service delivery organizations. They are social delivery organizations. They are welfare organizations. This is the term used even under FCRA, welfare-oriented organizations. And that forms the bulk of the nonprofit sector. There is a group which can be a think tank. There may be advocacy organizations. But 
one tends to club everyone together. So I think this mistrust and even for organizations that are dissenting, we must understand that we live in a sovereign democratic republic and dissent has a place in it. And therefore, just because there is dissent, it doesn't mean these NPOs are anti-national or anti-development. But I will not labor too much on these points. The second challenge that I find is regulatory delays. I know of endless organizations who have been waiting for over a year to get registered under FCRA or getting their renewal under FCRA. Okay, let's keep FCRA apart because only about 25,000 organizations seem to be registered under FCRA. Look at even under the income tax regime to get your tax exemption at a bare minimum four to five months and another four to five months after that to get your ADGs, uh, which is your tax deduction certificate. On one hand, the government's theme is ease of doing business. But is there any move towards ease of doing good? Is there any move towards ease of doing business? I think not. And speaking of business, a lot of people seem to think, including government, why this excessive dependence on foreign contributions? Why this excessive dependence on CSR? Where was CSR before the Indian Companies Act 2013? A group of companies were philanthropic for 100 years. If, uh, without having to name everyone knows them, the Tatas, the Godridges, uh, the Birlas, the Mahindras, were doing philanthropy long before CSR became mandatory. But CSR mandate has come only under the Indian Companies Act 2013 and made effective from 1st April 2014. Where was CSR funding before that? How did NGOs survive? They did survive, right? Foreign contributions, they have been coming off and on. But this speaking about alternate modes of uh, generating income for the sector. And because we spoke about ease of business and it reminded me about business, Oftentimes, organizations want to become self-sustaining, not be donor dependent, and therefore would like to have business activities. Business activities that are linked to their core objective, and which is fine. I mean, your objective is livelihoods, your objective is uh, teaching skills, etc. The income tax regime, and this income tax regime is not something we are talking of an act of 1961. And way back in 2008, the government, because most times we want to blame only a certain regime, I'm talking of 2008, the law was amended, the income tax amended, that if you have to be an organization falling under the category called any other object of general public utility, your business income cannot be more than 10 lakhs in any fiscal year. This was increased to 25 lakhs. And since the year 2015, it says, if you are a charitable organization that is established for charitable purpose and you have business income, which is fee based or on sale of goods, etc., which your beneficiaries may be producing, your business income cannot be more than 20% of your non-business income. I think this is restrictive. I mean, in my opinion, what could be more enabling? Let organizations do business and tax that business income completely but leave alone the non, I mean, non-business income. What happens over here? Assuming that you raise donations and grants of like a crore of rupees, but you had business income of 21 lakhs of rupees, which is more than 21%. The tax is not on your 21% business income. The tax is on your total income of 1 crore 21 lakhs. And that is the problem. The regime should be such go right ahead, insist that any business that NGOs do must be in furtherance of their objects and do tax the fee base or business income, but leave alone the donations and grants. And I think that would be important. Everyone talks about uh, ADG, that it's, it's a tax incentive. I do not think it's a major tax incentive. All that the donor gets is a 50% tax deduction on income which is liable to taxation by that individual or company, whatever the case may be. And it is restricted to 10% of the gross total income of that donor. So look at the restriction. It's not only 50% tax reduction, but restricted to 10% of the gross income of the taxable entity. 
So I don't think it's a very great tax incentive to offer. So what are the challenges before our sector? In my opinion, I think the legal regime is not enabling enough. More importantly, I find that it is far easier to run a for-profit organization than a non-profit organization in India. As Mavesh made the reference, at the state level, there is a charity commissioner or the registrar of societies. Even if you're a company, you will be registered with the ROC, the registrar of companies. At the central level for your income, the income tax will regulate you. If you are getting foreign contributions, the Ministry of Home Affairs will regulate you. And if you have goods and services with which you're dealing with, you cannot run away from GST either. <clears throat> you cannot run away from any of the HR laws that are applicable to the uh, companies. In other words, most of the laws that apply to companies apply to NPOs as well. And yet, government and others feel that NGOs are not regulated enough. I'm sorry to say, but I feel that this is a sector which is the most overregulated in the country, the nonprofit sector. And this is certainly something that I speak with my more than three decades experience in this sector. If we look at FCRA, and which is in the news right now, everybody is very concerned about the latest uh, Foreign Contribution Regulation Amendment Act of 2020. But why are we looking at it now? Look at what happened last year itself. We had what is called the Foreign Contribution Regulation Second Amendment Rules of 2019. It is. It came into effect from 16th September 2019, where every office bearer, which means whoever is on your board, your board of trustees, managing committee, whatever name you call it, and the key functionary must submit an affidavit. And what do you say in the affidavit? That I'm not in violation of any provision of Section 12.4 of the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Some of the affirmations that you have to make in the affid when you are saying that I will not be in violation of section 12.4 is that this person is not prosecuted or convicted for activities aimed at religious conversion or for creating communal tension or for creating disharmony or engaged in any acts of sedition. But most important, there is one affirmation which is there, which is you as an individual are not even prosecuted for any offense. The word is not used convicted, even if you are prosecuted. Now, it is not clear whether this is a prosecution which is civil in nature or criminal in nature. One assumes when you just speak of prosecution, it can be a civil thing. It could be a road accident for which you have been prosecuted. It could be a company related prosecution, which happens in a business life all the time. What are we to make of this? And so this is something of concern. What happened this year? And we'll come to now 2020. It begins with 1st February, before the lockdown. We had the union budget. And for the first time, we were told that organizations that are tax exempt under 12AA or 12A, whichever the case may be, or 1023C, which are educational hospitals, etc and having tax deduction under ATG would have to go for a renewal or a revalidation. Now, if we are looking at this scenario, of course, this was an exercise supposed to start from June this year, which got postponed. And now the whole exercise has been postponed to next year, but it's not gone away. Question is, is this going to be an automatic renewal or is this going to be a very detailed exercise in finding out. I just heard of, contacted two people yesterday who said, we are unable to find our trust deed. We just have some Xerox copies of this. We have some photocopies of it, but we don't even have our original trust deed. And we have all these kinds of issues. So, I mean, uh, are they going to put us through this kind of a very detailed exercises? I'm not too sure what's going to happen. But let's look at some of the very uh, uh, changes which are going to be of great concern to us. What are the biggest concerns? I think under this Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, prohibition of sub-granting of FCRA, 
has been something that has been of great concern. But if you think this is going to go away, I think the answer is no. I think the government has made up its mind. This is now law. We might have certain relaxations on the rules, but this is not going to go away. Going forward, intermediaries will have to reinvent themselves and implementing agencies will have to directly get monies from overseas. The second part, which I feel very concerned about is this cap on admin costs. There was always an add-on admin cost only with regard to foreign contributions, which was earlier 50%, but now it has been brought down to 20%. The point is that the role of the government is to regulate. Government has gone into a control mode where foreign contributions is concerned. It tells you that if you want to receive money in this country, it must come only through one particular bank, which happens to be the State Bank of India and only the New Delhi main branch. No other. You can thereafter have your utilization accounts elsewhere. I believe this is going into control mode and not regulatory mode. Even things like not more than 20% on admin. Admin cost is between the donor and the donee. It is not the job of the government to tell us no, what is here. You clearly care about this issue a great deal. Um, but uh, I just wanted to remind you that um, we, we have right. time and, and, and you were okay. going to be constructive. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So uh, do I stop at this point and maybe we leave room for uh, a Pushma to kind of make her presentation and then we can take questions. Well, if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, I think I'll be okay with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Noshir. Um, so I have the, uh, the difficult or the easy part. I don't know. I'm going to be talking about opportunities. Uh, I guess Noshir has kind of made us even more acutely aware of, you know, how bad it has been for the sector. Um, but uh, the other day, Amit Chandra was saying, you know, he's an op hopeless optimist. And uh, I, I think I belong to that category. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be trying and presenting not just opportunities as I see, or, um, but you know what I've been seeing NGOs and several organizations demonstrate in these difficult times. So I'm going to walk you through a quick deck over the next 10 minutes, and then we will open up for questions and answers. Thank you. Um, so I know that some of you are uh, new to Guides to India, so just a moment, what's my background? I run this organization that's trying to illuminate, you know, the work of civil society organizations to, you know, help them be more effective and impactful. So I'm from the sector, I'm from one of the NGOs, uh, helping other NGOs, uh, you know, do better. and to also help the giving community or the ecosystem make it easier for them to do good. Um, so as we, as Noshir was pointing it out, you know, it's so hard for us in India. And uh, uh, Ruth and Evesh also pointed out that, you know, we, we're not, uh, like none of the economies in Asia are in that perfect place, uh, but we are quite far from it. Um, the way I look at it is, you know, when, when we do civil society work, uh, we know that it's very much like tightrope walking. Um, we're the ones who've taken up missions that are far more difficult to implement. Uh, civil society organizations work in geographies, themes, um, reach out to populations that are otherwise so very difficult to reach out to. So we know that the work that we took on and what was cut out for us was always the more difficult one. Uh, we also know that uh, I worked in the for-profit sector before I came into civil society two decades ago. And I know that here we need to be far more transparent and accountable to the public at large because we're working with vulnerable communities who are equivalent of consumers in the for-profit world, uh, communities who cannot directly always hold us to account. If you're working for the disabled, if you're working for 
children. Um, we, we are working for populations that are not so educated. Uh, who we are helping, you know, we are trying to empower them. And often there is a disconnect between those who are providing for resources and those who are consuming um, the output of social delivery organizations. So it's incumbent upon us to be far more transparent and accountable to people who may not even be our direct stakeholders. But I do agree with everyone, you know, on this webinar and outside that we do deserve uh, to have it a bit more easier for us uh, to do good vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Bazaar and Sarkar, the other pillars um, of, you know, uh, the economy. Uh, we, we've taken on more difficult work. We want to hold ourselves to account but it does not mean that work has to be made more difficult for us in terms of regulation so that we spend more time doing the difficult work rather than spend more time, energy and resources just navigating through the maze of laws and compliances. Um, so, you know, in this dark scenario, where do I see the rays of light? Um, I, I do see an upsurge in individual giving and I shall share some examples of that. Um, there is renewed thinking uh, among grant makers. I saw somebody make a comment there. I think um, uh, Prabhu Loganathan saying that, could you talk about HNI? So be it HNI or foundations, there's at least a segment of them that are having very interesting conversations. Um, there's a lot that's happening on training and capacity building front. In fact, uh, there's so much overwhelming uh, announcements and webinars that I do sense there's even a certain amount of fatigue. So are we going for the right training programs? Are we being serious about it? Are we really adding value to ourselves? Um, you heard uh, Ruth talk about volunteering and Navesh talk about engaging corporations. So are we kind of grabbing some of these opportunities? Uh, the social stock exchange, for some people, it could be the panacea for everything. Uh, being one of the members of the technical group, what do I see there coming out for us? You know, how much of it is a ray of light? Um, so on each of those points, let me quickly touch upon. Uh, from where I come from, at least, you know, closer to the giving ecosystem in the last four years now with Giving Tuesday, which tries to celebrate individual giving, you know, creating more opportunities for everyone to build generosity into their daily lives around the year and celebrate it during Danutsa once a year. Well, what we see is the last six months chasing the crowd has never been so good. And why do I say that? Cost of retail fundraising has actually dropped. Most of you would have heard Mila, Keto, Impact Guru, Crowder, these organizations, some of them were not having any, uh, you know, uh, Crowder did not have an admin cost at all. Whereas the others have actually said no more admin costs. It's left to donors to tip these organizations or to add something for their admin costs if they feel like, but otherwise 100% of every donation goes actually to the charity or to the campaign. Um, there's only a small uh, cut for the financial transaction cost. Even financial transaction costs have dropped. Most of us know that UPI transactions is absolutely zero cost that is deducted and most of retail giving actually happens in you know, small denominations or there's a huge jump if you look at the numbers put out by the National Payments Corporation of India. Digital payments have really skyrocketed for more and more people embracing that. So are we kind of embracing these modes of payments? Um, matching is gaining ground. Matching, those have been into retail fundraising know that donors kind of uh, foundations, high net worth individuals kind of sweeten it or incentivize it for new individual givers to uh, make their giving more impactful by announcing that there would be a thousand rupee match on a retail donation, or there would be a one-on-one -on -one match, or there's a 20% match. And this has been going on uh, for almost 12 to 15 years now, but it's becoming more popular in the recent past. In fact, the A.T. Chandra Foundation along with Satwa put out a report on matching um, and encouraging, you know, traditional givers and others to support nonprofits in making their ask much more compelling by announcing matching. Um, and, and, and matching really works and more people are learning how to make their campaigns be more successful around matching. 
I uh, already mentioned more digital payment options. You now have uh, not just the philanthropy, you know, ecosystem players, the donation platforms, uh, giving more tools to nonprofits, but even payment processors like Razorpay and others have uh, programs and options and tools for nonprofits to create, uh, you know, uh, donor specific payment links and stuff to make it far more effective click to give is now just getting simpler and simpler by the day um like i said more people are online and therefore the crowd is definitely much more accessible um now coming to you know in grant making itself i said there is a, a lot of thinking on how to help nonprofits better especially in these difficult times so are you hearing these buzzwords from your foundations and your high net worth donors uh, from some of the CSR donors and are you kind of being part of the conversation where it's happening? Uh, many of them are saying, if not now, when? So maybe not corporates, but high net worth donors. I think the number of signatories who got added to living my promise, that is people saying they will give away 50% or more in their lifetime or afterwards has actually crossed the 50 number. Um, and more and more people are getting added there, more young people are getting added there. I, I hear conversations on Facebook from several of these philanthropists saying, we are looking at you know, increasing our giving budgets. We are going beyond our traditional thematic areas. Um, and, and therefore there is that conversation going on. As soon as the pandemic happened, a certain number of donors actually joined a collaborative. They signed up to saying that uh, they are going to uh, encourage people to repurpose their grants. They're going to reduce reporting uh, so that people can more, focus more on, on doing the work. Um, there were announcements on rapid grants, uh, like the Omidia one, Omidia Network of India that was announced, saying that, you know, how do we kind of go away from our traditional uh, long cycles of grant making and kind of quickly respond to needs in the sector? Uh, there has been regrouping by people on the giving side, as well as they have been encouraging nonprofits to regroup to kind of see, you know, whether they can form new collaborations around sharing resources, sharing, you know, uh, office space or sharing people. So, you know, how do you regroup to become more effective and efficient? Uh, there's a lot of conversation around resilience. There's training around resilience. Um, I, I think CSIP organized a training program. There are a bunch of others, you know, Dasra or Atma, you know, a whole lot of people announced programs around helping nonprofits get more resilient and revisit their strategies. There are several grants helping people to reimagine their intervention, uh, to really think out of the box, um, you know, uh, grants that would help you kind of, uh, because everyone talks about the new normal, but these organizations saying that completely reimagine what you're doing and apply for these grants. Um, I also kind of touched upon saying about, you know, the whole fatigue around online charchas and webinars and programs. Uh, but it's one thing to just sign up for anything and everything, but there are lots of training programs like ISA, ILS has announced a fundraising program. Uh, we at Guidestar India and, and Giving Tuesday India have just announced, um, you know, the online fundraising superheroes program. Likewise, there are several programs being announced for us to retrain ourselves for these emerging times. So are you kind of signing up, whether it's for the resilience strategy, for fundraising, there are programs for technology and digital resources. So CSIP has just announced, you know, their summit is focusing on technology, which is just coming up in November. Um, there are a whole lot of training programs on storytelling and why this is important. I'll touch upon that in the next few minutes, not just storytelling for retail fundraising, but storytelling to policymakers, storytelling um, you know, to our existing funders, storytelling to the future generation. How are we training ourselves to uh, tell stories more effectively so that you know, we um, policymakers are looking to us not uh, with a different lens, like Noshid pointed out that ours is the sector that has the harshest steps. Why is that happening? Perhaps this is one thing that we could do better. There are lots of training programs happening on leadership training, uh, retraining our leaders uh, you know, for the emerging times. 
um, you heard about volunteering. So are we engaging virtual volunteers? Uh, while the study showed that we do engage a significant amount or there are, I believe 46% organizations were doing crowdfunding, 70% want to do more NGOs, want to engage volunteers. But when at Guides to India and Giving Tuesday India, we're putting out these opportunities we don't really see that much offtake from not-for-profits. I don't know if it is a worry, it is concern about how to handle this, or it is, you know, the inertia to try out new things because things didn't work out in the past. If you're not trying out, you're actually missing. Uh, so I, I just wanted to put up pictures of, you know, there's this singer who's been trying for two years to teach music, but come COVID, come the use of everyone being on Google Meet and Zoom, and she, she could work with Angel Express to teach music to kids. Or let's teach English.org, which was born during the pandemic. Every time I talk about it, you know, the number of volunteers have increased. Now there are more than 2,500 volunteers. A few weeks ago, I was saying 1,700 volunteers. And do we value these kind of resources? Uh, we need to ask questions. 10 NGOs got, you know, within a week, new websites that could have cost anywhere between 25,000 to 100,000 rupees to make. And as we speak, I was looking at my WhatsApp group that are corporate employees, you know, volunteering to build NGO websites or to refurbish with the help of Boomi as part of their digital looks of program. We're all talking about pivoting our programs, but are we trying new ideas? Um, and do these ideas work? I, I just wanted to present two of them that have actually worked, but I've been firsthand involved. The Seva Mela that was announced by Danutsal from traditional physical on the ground Seva Melas, they just went virtual. And you know, I'm happy to say that 187 stalls were put up and more than 15,000 visitors came and pledges were made. You can see these numbers. And if you participated, maybe it was not a grand success. Maybe you did not uh, figure out, or we were still trying to figure out how to do it well. Uh, we had only 63 people at our stall and spent an entire day, but there was an enormous amount of learning that we had, and we want to use that idea again and again. Um, the virtual run, so the physical marathons did not happen. And for Giving Tuesday India, we said the India Giving Tuesday India generosity run, and we wanted to kind of help people reach 79,000 kilometers that Mahatma Gandhi walked. And surprise, surprise, actually, it crossed that much amount and you know there was more than 80,000 kilometers that people did and all of this happened through collaboration through new forms of partnerships new ways of doing things um, several people came together I don't want to go into detail many of you have attended those webinars but try new ideas and keep improving upon them as you're implementing them now coming to the social stock exchange let me spend a couple of minutes here um, so you know this became the buzzword and a lot of people are thinking, oh, this might help us. This could be the new way of raising funds. Is it going to be easy? Is it going to be hard? Is it really going to make all dreams come true? Be prepared, there's going to be higher accountability requirements, more disclosures, and it's common sense, right? When a company registers on a stock exchange and becomes public, we all know that in the business world, it means far more public accountability you know, you make your prospectus, you make your quarterly reports, you make your disclosures. So that's going to apply here as well. More progress reporting. So it's not going to be end of project. Maybe we don't know the timelines, but it is going to be reporting as you go along because you are kind of trying to raise money from people uh, who are far removed from your program, who you may not be directly engaging. Um, impact assessment through external social auditors uh, and these are going to be all kind of, there's going to be frameworks put out there. The group is looking at making it simple, looking at size of organizations, making it easier for, you know, smaller organizations or newer organizations. But it's important when you are looking at participating in a social stock exchange, you know, that the basic DNA requirement is going to be much higher than what you would do while crowdfunding. There is going to be coming face to face with the for-profit enterprises and the not-for-profit organizations. And perhaps this is the first time you're going to be competing for the same capital. There are going to be different types of instruments available, um, but we, we cannot be saying that, you know, we are going to be participating on a stock exchange and we, are not, we want everything exclusively for not-for-profits. But so while it's going to be hard, what is going to be easy is 
It's going to force us to make projections and talk about our future, um, to talk about our projects, milestones, talk about our challenges, risks, expected failures. And because there are people going to be uh, supporting social causes, you know, how do we educate those people? How much more storytelling is going to happen? And one big positive that's going to come to the sector is greater visibility. Uh, so we could have newer frameworks. Uh, we could have greater visibility and access to new capital. So what could we be doing? Reimagine resource mobilization. Let's not look at just one versus the other. And the moment there is something happening on FCRA, beginning to worry that everything is going to end. So if we are going to diversify our resource portfolio, there's individual giving, there's a lot of domestic giving, there's giving, there's, uh, you're tapping foundations, you're tapping corporations, you're tapping employee individuals, you have volunteers who could be supporting you. So in-kind, so time, talent, in-kind resources, monetary resources, stand out with transparency in public reporting. I mean, I can vouch for what the sector has been doing 10,400 NGOs are on Guides to India voluntarily making disclosures. So I have great hope for the sector to kind of continue to do more than what the law requires. Um, tell your story effectively, upwards, downwards, laterally. Engage, engage, engage. I think more than ever before to, along with transparency, I think it's important that we keep conversations going with our own teams. You heard uh, the report talk about you know, employee retention being a problem. So, you know, how do we engage people within the organization, people in the community, people, you know, who are supporting us in terms of monetary and other resources? How do we engage policymakers? How do we, we, we saw the debates in the parliament, right, for FCRA, and we saw some of our uh, elected representatives batting for us, but not with sufficient data. So how do we kind of engage all of that? So we are waiting here to help you do good better, all of us in this webinar. I'm handing over back to my other co-panelists and we'll take up questions now. Thank you. Hi, Pushpa and Nashir. Hi. Uh, so we have Guy uh, from the CAPS team uh, helping us uh, coordinate and facilitate this uh, Q&A session. Over to you, Guy Thank you. Thank you. Um, firstly, I just want to thank all the panelists for sharing their very insightful and valuable um, views uh, on these various um, topics, timely topics. Um, you know, and with that, I'd like to just ask um, uh, a few questions of them that were posed by the audience. Um, some have already been answered, so I'll just be brief and stick to the ones that haven't been. Um, one of the things um, that was asked uh, to uh, Mevesh and and Ruth is how does the doing good index impact local civil society organizations or SDOs? Um, I think that means local versus national. Um, uh, so um, it it the the kind of good regulations that we that we um, advocate for and the kind of um, measures that we're talking about are equal opportunity. Um, Therefore, little ones and big, big, little organizations, big organizations, small funders, big funders. Um, I think everyone wants more accountability and transparency in the sector. That's why Pushpa has done so well with GuideStar India. Um, that's why Nashir's uh, um, uh, um, expertise is sought so often. Um, I, I, I agree with Pushpa that in some ways our sector is guilty until proven innocent. Um, we are, um, we're not given the benefit of the doubt that, the com that companies and government are, are given. And so when there is a fraud case or when there is a bad apple, people say, wow, all, all nonprofits, um, all social enterprises are, are not very good. Um, so I think that um, if we had more trust, we had more accountability, it would help small organizations as well as big ones. And can I add a couple of things to that? One is that technology and uh, you know, social media platforms are actually quite a big equalizer when it comes to flattening uh, the playing field a little bit. 
for all uh, for nonprofits of all shapes and sizes. And we do, uh, this is not part of constructing the index, but in our survey, we do ask nonprofits, you know, are you engaging with social media? And the answer is yes, by a majority of them. We also ask them if they are engaging with local traditional media to tell their stories better. And again, encouragingly, a majority answer yes to that. So these channels are, you know, nonprofits are becoming more savvy about telling their stories and technology is, um, is helping with that. Uh, because we do know that uh, often a lot of funding tends to flow to larger, bigger nonprofits that Ruth likes to call superstar NGOs that people are aware of and they know about. And technology can amplify the voice of the equally important but not superstar NGO. Great, thank you. Um, I guess, Mosher, uh, I know you uh, mentioned that uh, there are three factors that help in doing good and human being one of them. Uh, with the new FCRA, um, or with the new uh, legislation, if representation on NGO boards um, linking the directors to an Aadhaar will become more difficult, how, how do you think this can be addressed? Uh, yes, they have made uh, the requirement of providing the Aadhaar uh, <laughs> mandatory. Uh, and uh, this, I've been interacting with people who are not very comfortable comfortable with giving a copy of their Aadhaar. And historically, so far, I've seen two or three board members step off the boards. And therefore, again, as you can see, there are legislations and regulatory changes that are not creating an enabling environment. If we will not have good members of the board coming together, who will have to sign affidavits that they are not terrorists, they are not, uh, I mean, they have to provide their Aadhaar card it's going to be more and more challenging. So I think uh, government needs to have a more benign uh, look at all this, in my opinion. Uh, uh, some efforts are being made to speak to the ministry uh, to slightly water it down, and that might happen under the rules, that maybe not a copy of the other, can they provide a copy of the passport or something like that, or any other identification? Because the rationale is, uh, it's again part of Section 12 of uh, FCRA, that a person must not be fictitious. And that is the reason why the Aadhaar is asked for. That's, that's a good requirement. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, one of the other questions we received was that um, government is not investing enough in research. Um, so UN organizations and big NGOs or INGOs are increasingly giving out research to corporates like PwC, KPMG, uh, and CSR regs also don't uh, cover research. Can you shed some light on what the future of these nonprofits are that aren't that are um, not SDOs? And I, I open that up to any of the panelists. Uh, Ruth, would you like to take that? Um, sure. <laughs> um, I think the question is that. Um, uh, I, I, I can't speak on behalf of UN organizations. I can speak on behalf of um, the notion that um, we're all um, trying to find better ways and solutions. And the government of India has, as I mentioned earlier, um, contracted a lot with think tanks, especially that do economic policy research. Um, so, um, that is a history that's kind of full and vibrant in India. Um, there haven't been that many organizations that do do social um, research on social delivery organizations, on philanthropy. I mean, that's frankly one of the reasons that CAPS created the sister organization that we did. Um, because there was uh, 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 people expressed to us the need to do more research in our field. Um, that's something that's really started in the past few years, and I see um, fairly exponential growth, but still early days. There's a lot that we don't understand. And um, as I mentioned, India is a very dynamic uh, environment, and there's a lot of research to be done in terms of what is working and what isn't working, and efforts to link the excuse me, those findings with policymakers so that they can make in much more informed um, decisions. Was there anyone else that wanted to? Anything else from that one? Yeah. Um, the last question, um, I guess I know we have a time constraint, but the last question I have is, um, 
Um, actually, it's a comment and then a question. So there are disincentives when government takes services from nonprofits and taxes them for payments by signing fee-based contracts instead of giving a grant. Payment as a result is, can be back-end loaded, uh, pushing SDOs to take loans or dig into reserves to invest in projects. Um, these aspects obviously um, aren't, uh, you know, a gen that's not a, to make a generalized statement, but the question was how can government more effectively procure from SDOs? That's a good, I think, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Moshe. Go ahead. yeah, yeah I mean, Moshe, uh, go first. Uh, I would just like to make a submission that, yes, it is unfortunate that government usually does not uh, have grant agreements with NGOs. They usually go into what are called works contracts and service contracts, which again become problematic from the income tax point of view. Once again, you have to be wary of the fact that uh, uh, your business income does not exceed the threshold. Uh, there would be GST implications. It means, of course, the GST would have to be paid by the government, not by you. but uh, 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 but you would, it is an additional compliance that you would uh, need to have. So uh, it has its challenges. But Mavesh, I mean, from a non-legal perspective, if there's anything you want to say, it's most welcome. Yeah, I want to say that actually these, it, it's, it's, it's important to remember that these kinds of um, regulations and legacy regulations, existing regulations of the procurement process as a whole, where the procurement process has not then been modified for the social sector. And you know, the, the solution is to give that some extra attention and see, okay, how can we remove the roadblocks to procurement for the social sector? That applies to the taxes point the, 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 that they have to pay, as well as the whole reimbursement system that works very well for for profit companies that have access to loans and may have other assets that allow them to pay, uh, make payments upfront and then get reimbursed from government later but cash scrapped NGOs don't simply don't have those resources. So it's a matter of making some adjustments to the existing system. Or the government can go even further. There are two economies in Asia that do offer extra incentives for nonprofits, particularly uh, to bid for government procurement contracts. And Vietnam is one of them. I'm forgetting which the other one is where they go a bit further and offer um, you know, preferential uh, treatment to nonprofits that, that do that. So there's a spectrum of uh, tools available here, tool policymakers that can make this process better. And it's also incumbent on the social sector to communicate some of this. The dialogue with government is very, very critical in removing some of these misunderstandings and uh, misfires that are unintentional. And I just wanna add and Pushpa said dialogue with government is key, we agree. Um, just as there are best practices when it comes to delivery mechanisms, there are best practices when it comes to policies. Um, and there are good policies and not so good policies. And one of the benefits of really the doing good index, if I can um, blow our own horn, is that we can look across 18 economies and see which mechanisms are working particularly well and why. And just as Mevesh said, there are two economies that actually incentivize um, nonprofit organizations to bid on government procurement contracts. So um, when the day comes that we can come back to India, hopefully not too far in the distance, um, uh, we want you know, to work with those people on, the, on this call and our partners push by this year to really take our findings to government and use this data in order to um, really promote best practices, not so much advocacy about what's going wrong, but as a resource about what can go right. So if I could then just slip in one last question, which is um, what is the single most important thing that the government could do to help India move from doing okay to doing better? And I would say to that, that government needs to start um, realizing that the, the social sector is not the enemy. Um, the social sector is a friend and a colleague and a group of people and organizations that are committed to more healthy, sustainable, happy people and communities. And so if we start from that place, if we start from realizing we're in this together, um, 
that would be the one thing I would really think that would be um, uh, set the tone. Nishir, do you want to make some no, closing No, I, I, I just applauded and said uh, <laughs> absolutely correct. I mean, I, I, you echo my sentiments. In fact, it, you kind of summarize what I was trying to say, that let's build trust and let's, just as there is ease of doing business, let there be ease of doing good in this country. Great. Well, um, then, then that's... Uh, that, that's a great high I note can, to end on. Yes. I, I think, uh, Pushpa, do you agree? Absolutely. So I just wanted to thank everyone who's, uh, you know, come in. Uh, we still have more than 100 people, uh, you know, with us. And though we've overshot time. So thank you very much for taking interest in the subject. Um, you know, we sent out communications without any keywords like FCRA. Um, and so I'm so glad that our panelists have, you know, kind of given us a more balanced uh, view on you know how are we doing based on data um, over 2000 organizations have actually been surveyed across 18 economies and i think that kind of gives you a, a good uh, mirror to hold against and kind of see our situation uh, we like ruth said we now have really data to kind of go and make uh, constructive and meaningful conversations with people you know uh, within, above, outside, across, you know, all sectors. Um, we have Noshir who can always give us, you know, uh, a very clear view on what uh, the legal environment is beginning to look like. Uh, we know where the gaps are in the sector for sure, and it requires collective effort. Uh, I saw Santosh put out in the Q&A, you know, uh, about the Edelman Trust Barometer and how we can kind of collaboratively address this. Um, I think government has been making sometimes moves like on the same day when the FCRA legislation happened, that very same day, you know, the technical group of the SSC was put together. So it's not like everything is going bad at all times. It's very important for us to always keep, be on the lookout for opportunities because unless we see those opportunities, we cannot engage in kind of uh, you know, uh, addressing the challenges. Um, uh, we've all come together and there are lots of conversations happening around this sector. That's that's a very great thing. I think in no way the pandemic has diminished dialogue. I think it has only amplified and increased opportunities. You don't no longer have to catch a flight or travel somewhere to meet somebody, right? So let's make good use of these opportunities. More than ever before in the last 20 years that I've been in the sector, there are resources for building capacity. Um, so I would say let's make good use of you know, what we have before us and continue this conversation. Thanks to Ruth, Mevesh, Gayatri, and a very big thanks and big hug to Noshir for you know, always being there uh, to keep us in check. And for an optimist like me, you need a balancing voice um, in Noshir <laughs> and you know, the kind of... <laughs> um, in fact, Nishir, you balanced all of us. <laughs> <laughs> or did I bash everyone up? <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. been great. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. If you're getting into the festive season. Let's continue to be safe. And let's continue to, you know, uh, be uh, more proactive in how we address situations around us and be there, not be in a catch up mode, but kind of begin to have conversations that set agendas for these kinds of meetings. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank to everyone you. celebrating and Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.